my essential units, it's the Central Man here, so back again with another WCW pay-per-view review. So we're getting away from WCW in the year of 1999. So I'm going to travel back into the other parts of WCW in those 1990s to their golden years of WCW. That was uh, between the second half of 1996 to 1998 until... The company started to decline in the second half of 1999. So this time we're going into the year of 1997. For many of fans, this is, I think it's, it's I think it's 97 or 98. It's the most successful year in the company's history. It's all time high for the uh, the product in the year of 1997 for WCW because of the, um, the star power they had. You know, like they got uh, Hollywood Hulk Hogan. You got like yeah the outsiders, Macho Man Randy Savage, Ric Flair, Roddy Piper, um, Sting, who's not really necessarily wrestling throughout 1997. He did wrestle at Starcade at the end of the year, Nitro defeating Raw in the ratings war in the consistent basis until Raw defeat Nitro, snapping their 83 winning streak the following year in 1998. So. You know, the WWF was picking up some steam with the whole Heart Foundation versus the WWF throughout the whole summer of 97 until the whole situation at Survivor Series at the end of the year. So, it's been a long time since I review a Great American Bash pay-per-view. The last Great American Bash pay-per-view I reviewed on this channel was the 1998 uh, Great American Bash pay-per-view that was still in the golden years of WCW so yeah I'm going to review the 1997 Great American Bash show at the <laughs> name this is a name of the center back then it's called the Mark of the Quad Cities right now it's called the Tax Slayer Center in Moline Illinois I'm guessing it's outside of Chicago on the 15th of June 1997 that's on Father's Day not really because Father's Day uh, is on the 19th of June. So it's basically four days before Father's Day. The attendance for the show was 9,613. The 1997 Great American Bash Show received about 220,000 pay-per-view buys. An upgrade than the 1996 Great American Bash Show. The main event of that show was the Giants, that's Paul White, you know, the in AEW right now, the future big show, defeating Lex Luger and retaining the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. I'm guessing at the same night you had Hall and Nash, the Outsiders, attacking Eric Bischoff. This is before the start of the whole NWO um, era. This show is in the middle of the NWO era in WCW. The 1996 Great American Bash received about, I think it was 170,000 pay per view buys. I think it was 165 or, I think it was 170,000 pay per view buys they had. So, anyway, so the commentators for the 1997 Great American Bash pay per view, the whole bulk of the show is um, Tony Schiavone, Bobby the Brain Heenan, and the American Dream Dusty Rhodes. Mike Tenay was on commentary for the opener. It was a, a cruiserweight match. We'll get to that shortly. And also Lee Marshall was on commentary for the women's title match. We also will get to the women's title match later on in this review. So, so the first match to kick off... By the way, there's nine matches on the show. Anyway, so the first match to kick off the 1997 Great American Bash show. Yeah, it's a cruiserweight match. Uh, we got the Ultimo Dragon taking on Psychosis with... Sonny Ono in his corner. So, Sonny Ono used to be the Ultimo Dragons manager. At the previous month's pay per view, um, the Ultimo Dragon was defending his WCW TV uh, championship against Lord Stephen Regal. That's the future William Regal in WWE right now in AEW. In that match, Sonny Ono, uh, sorry, Sonny Ono, by the way, speaking too fast, by the way. <laughs> Sonny Ono turned on the Ultimo Dragon, cost the Ultimo Dragon the TV title against Regal on that show. So this match is basically an I respect match. So it's not like 
the I Respect match, that was uh, the match between Brian Pillman and Kevin Sullivan. That's a typical I Quit match. This is just a standard one-on-one -on -one match. Um, and this was good. This was a good way to kick off the pay-per-view. I really like the um, the action, you know, because the um, those mid, really, the, yeah, this, we're in the, um, the middle of the golden years of the Cruiserweights. Um, yeah, the, the Cruiserweight era in those WCWs, in those mid to late 90s. It was an all-time high. Really enjoy the the, the fast-paced action. I really enjoy it. it was fast-paced action. I really enjoy. Sonny Ono did got involved a bit. You know, he didn't like brought this match down, but it was really good. I enjoy it. Uh, the one spot I want to talk about. Um, uh, I thought it was like a battle of the roll-ups, but it wasn't a roll-up. You know, like a psychosis roll-up. Uh, <laughs> roll-up. Uh, Ultimo Dragon. Then Dragon. Roll up, um, psychosis, psychosis outside the ring, and then follow up with Ultimo Dragon hit the Ice ID Moonsault onto um, psychosis outside the ring. That was cool. Um, in the end, uh, Ultimo Dragon made uh, psychosis tap out with the Dragon Sleeper, and yeah, he got the victory. Um, I, uh, you know, Ultimo Dragon is very underrated in pro wrestling history, not just in WCW history, but in pro wrestling history. In, yeah, in the history of the Cruiserweight division in WCW, when people talk about Cruiserweight uh, division in WCW, or the Cruiserweights in WCW, people talk about Rey Mysterio, Eddie Guerrero, Billy Kidman, uh, Chris Jericho, uh, Dean Malenko, uh, Juventud Guerrera, Psychosis. Um, yeah, uh, Ultimo Dragon's not on, on the radar, he's not on the system, I don't know, I think he's an underrated worker. You know, he was in WWE for a little bit in the Rufus Aggression era. In the, in the 2003, 2004 uh, period in the Rufus Aggression era, but yeah, very underrated in my opinion, so. Anyway, but on, uh, yeah, but anyway, I'm rambling by the way, so yeah, it was a good match, you know, I like the, the Cruiserweights to start a WCW pay-per-view, it's a good way to get the fans buzzing and prepare for the rest of the night, so. It, yeah, a good, this was good. Uh, and by the way, Ultimo Dragon went on to uh, regain the TV title in July. I think it was on, on an episode of Nitro. So the next match, this is a number one contenders match for the WCW World Tag Team Championships. Uh, Steiner Brothers taking on Hon Heat with Sister Sherry. That's former Cessational Sherry in the WWF. You know, she was Cessational, Cessational Sherry in the WWF. Right now in WCW. Not right now, but in WCW she was Sister Sherry. So, this is more between the Steiners and the Outsiders, because the whole bulk of 97, the Steiners were chasing after the Outsiders for the WCW Tag Team Championships. They briefly won the belts at the first sold-out show in 97, at the start of the year, but they kind of reversed the decision. The, you know, Bischoff awarded the Tag Team Tower belts back to the Outsiders, you know, led up to Randy Anderson getting fired, you know. Yeah, check out my review of out, uh, Sold Out 97. So, yeah, the whole bulk of 97 is the Steiners chasing out of the, the tag team champions. So, so J.J. Dillon like, named the Steiners as the number one contender for the WCW World Tag Team Championships. Um, Holland Heat got triggered, so the build-up to this, basically both the Steiners and the Holland Heat basically costing each other uh, matches. So, J.J. Dillon announced this match on the show. By the way, the winner faced the World Tag Team Champions at Road Wild in August. Um, this was a good match. I really like this match. And also, the one addressing, you know, it's like nitpick, it's Booker T. In my last review, that is May uh, not Mayhem, uh, Slumbery 99 he did the whole, oh, that grunts. You know, it's a way to get, like, some reaction. I'm glad he don't really do it when he was in WWE and... In later years in TNA, when he was part of the main event mafia, the ah, uh, just it's just ah, uh, the ah, uh, it's I, I hate that. It, it just makes it just make you like an a total idiot. But um, anyway, the match between the Steiners, the Hall Heat, the good good chemistry. It was a mixture of brawling and technical style wrestling. But um, yeah, not that bad matches. Not that bad match. They they had bad matches in the before and after. Um, the end ending was a bit odd. It is on a storyline standpoint, but um, so here's the ending of this. So basically, um, I think um, I'm guessing like 
like the Steiners. I think I think like uh, basically had uh, Vincent. That's the former Virgil in the WWF. Now he was Vincent, part of the NWO. Basically, I think I don't know. I think Steiner was going for a move off the top rope uh, or something like that. So basically, he had, he had Vincent basically elbow Booker T, and the referee called for disqualification. I think the reason why he he has to do that because make sure the Steiners won't get a shot. Uh, another shot at the tag team title belts against the Outsiders. So it makes sense. So basically the Harlem Heat won this match via disqualification. Basically will face the winner of the tag team title belts later on the show. It will face the, the tag team champions at Road Wild in August. Unfortunately that's not the case. That's a lot of BS because by the way um, the Steiners went on to face the Outsiders at Road Wild in August. So it's basically just basically... Uh, Vincent's uh, back, you know, Vincent Outsiders plan is totally backfired on them because, you know, because the Steiners got the last laugh after all, so. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was a good match, you know, it was a, it was a, 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 a it declined a bit from the opener, but it was a fun match to watch, so. The final two, uh, not final two matches, the next two matches on the show took a nosedive, you know, of, of quality, you know. You know, you got a good, a good Cruiserweight opener. And a fun tag team match. So the next match, oh boy, um, we got Hugh Morris represent the Dungeon of Doom taking on Conan. Um, Conan used to be part of the Dungeon of Doom, but he left the group. Um, so um, with Hugh Morris, by the way, he is Bill DeMott, and he looks like Grim from Grim's Toy Show, by the way, with a facial expression. He's wearing like Batman entire, like Batman like style entire. He's not wearing actually the Batman like symbol, but he wears like one half has the Riddler symbol with the the question mark, and the other part with the joke. I'm guessing that's the laughs that symbol of the Joker, because at this moment in time in '97 that Batman movie was released. You know that Batman and Robin film that was fucking stupid, that almost killed the superhero genre. I'm glad it stick around for the net for the next quarter of the century. Anyway, the match was just meh. Feel like a match on Nitro. No one gives a shit. No one gives a shit about the Dungeon of Doom. It's just what it is. You know, at this moment in time, people more talk about the NWO than the Dungeon of Doom. This is not the mid '90s WCW. You know, they should have end after the whole th after Hogan defeat uh, the Dungeon of Doom or the Alliance destroy Hulkamania at. Um, on Sense of 96, but they still continue to do the whole Dungeon and Doom faction. Anyway, so trying to keep it short and simple. In the end, um, Ku Morris hit the, I think it's, um, was it Laugh, La was it Laugh Out Loud or No Chance for Laugh? Basically, it's a moonsault, by the way, he's trying to hit, but instead of Conan basically snake eyes him, basically, Ku Morris' head hits the, uh, the top turn buckle. In the end, he, uh, Conan applied the Tequila Sunrise. I don't know what it is. Is it an armbar? Or I think it's like a single Boston Leg Crab. In, instead of um, Hugh Morris tapping out, he just basically passed out and, took, uh, and Conan won this match. And by the way, Conan went on to join the NWO. And Hugh Morris will be a future member, the future leader of the Misfits in action. That's in WCW in the year of 2000. But besides that, yeah, it was... Yeah, I feel like I feel like it was went too long. A lot of rest holds. This is a match you probably see on Nitro or or Saturday Night Main Event, not on a pay per view that people spend a lot of money. And this is technically the worst match of the night. Um, we got Glazer taking on Raph with Mortis. That's uh, Chris Canyon under a mask, and uh, with James Vandenberg. That's the future. Sinister Minister in ECW, and the future Father James Mitchell in TNA, a decade later. Um, by the way, uh, Raph is Brian Clark, the future member of Chronic in WCW in the year 2000. So, yeah, yeah, they could, they've been feuding for years now since Glacier debuted with the company in 1996. Glacier is basically is based on Sub-Zero. He's a character from the Mortal Kombat games. I got a copy of number ten and number eleven. You know, you know. I played, I played um, a complete number ten. Still in the middle, completing uh, Mortal Kombat eleven on, on, on story mode. I haven't played um, MK eleven for a long time. So, 
Anyway, so um, that that they've been feuding for months now. That's like the build up to this. They've been feuding for the feuding for months, and both of them have crappy gimmicks. You know, I don't want to get into it. You know, and yeah, this match sucked. Basically, they like like handcuff Mortis on the turnbuckle. You know, without any outside interference. I don't think there was any outside of it, outside interference with uh, James Vandenberg, the future James Mitchell. The match was just cry kick, cry kick, cry punches. That's it. It's just a cry match, not a pro wrestling match. There's not barely any wrestling. With the Conan Hugh Morris match, at least we got some wrestling, some technical style wrestling. This is just shit, man. It's just karate kick, cry kick, cry punch. What the fuck? Uh, Try to keep it this match short and simple, folks. Um. In the end, Mortis kind of throw, trying to attempt to throw the key. Oh, no, not key. He kind of throw the chain towards uh, Raph, but Raph is a dumbass because Raph is fucking, I, I don't know how tall he is. He's probably like 6'3", 6'4", 6'5", 6'6". He threw it over Raph's head. Uh, Glazier hits Raph with the chain, hit the super kick. He didn't, they didn't really, they cut out the um the super kick in the in the in a split second. Glazier won this match. Afterwards, Mortis and Raph beat the fuck out of uh, Glacier, lock, locked him, you know, locked the handcuffs on him, and that was it. Moving on, it's stupid gimmicks, you know, Mortis will be, become the future Chris Canyon, you know, he'll end up doing the whole, he'll be part of the Jersey Triad with DDP, and then he become a DDP knockoff when he's doing the Positunely, was it, the Positunely Canyon in WCW in the year 2000, so, yeah. Glacier's shit, it's just cry kicks, cry kicks, karate chops, that's the whole of the match, you know. It's just a crappy version of a crappy karate fight, that's all it is, you know. I don't, I like karate fights, they're much better than this, man, so it's, yeah, they've been watching a lot, they've been, probably watched the mid-90s, um, not the, the, the recent Mortal Kombat movie from last year, but the, um, the 19, I think it was 1995, they released that Mortal Kombat film. Jesus Christ. So let's move on, man. I'm rambling, by the way. After the two bad matches to a decent one. Um, this is for the WCW Women's Championship. Um, we've got Akira Hokuto with Sonny Ono in his corner. Defending the WCW Women's Championship against Medusa. So here's the backstory. So, so uh... Akira Hokuto defeat Medusa in the finals of the WCW Women's Title Tournament at Starcade at the end of 1996. They had the um, the second match at uh, Spring Stampede in April of 97. So this is the third match. And by the way, um, uh, Medu uh, uh, Luna Fashan helped uh, Hokuto defeat Medusa on that on that show. You know, on that match on that show to retain the title. So. Um, you know, Sonny Ono give Medusa one more chance to face Akira Hokuto for the title. And this is not just a normal title match. This is a title versus career match. So basically, if Medusa wins, she becomes the uh, the WCW Women's Champion. But if he loses, oh, she loses, by the way, she must retire. So, um, yeah, um... The title was not... I'll get more... This is the last match that the WCW Women's title was defended on TV. But um, I'll get to that after this match. So, the match was decent. I like I like this match. You know, I think there's some chemistry between Hokuto and Medusa. Um, this is all about the knee injury. So, basically, Medusa hit like a... I think it was, a, a, was it an axe handle off the top rope. She tweaked her knee. The bo Some bulks of the match, you had um, basically... Uh, Hokuto working on the knee of Medusa. She reached the ropes. Um, yeah, you had Medusa trying to hit like a Northern Light suplex pin. So, you know, basically Ono stopped it. You know, got involved without the referee noticing. In the end, uh, Hokuto hit the, um, I think it was a Brain Buster. What is it called? A Northern, play a Northern Lights Brain Buster? I don't know. It's basically a Brain Buster. Onto basically a suplex, by the way. I think it was a brain buster. It's one or the other. So, Hokuto managed to beat Medusa for the third time. It might be a brain buster, you know, some kind of weird brain buster slash suplex combo to win this match and retain the A. Um, I keep saying A, not AEW, uh, the WCW Women's Championship. 
Um, so, yeah, um, it, this was Medusa's final match, you know, she was in tears, she's selling the knee, she's selling the knee pretty damn well, it's not like, it's, I, I don't know, she literally injured her knee in the process, I don't know if that, I think, I don't know if that was a work or a shoot, not a shoot, but I don't know if that it was a work, so, afterwards you got the, like, the referee and the med, I think it was some medical team, kind of carried Medusa out, and then afterwards, you got Mean Gene Oakland trying to interview the well, the medical doctor, the doctor and Medusa. I think Medusa shouts, "Go, not now!" And then the fans chanting, chanting towards Mean Gene, "Leave her alone." So yeah, like I said, this is the last time that the WCW Women's Title was defended because the women's the women's division was. Didn't really got any um, exposure like the world title, the cruiserweight title, the United States title, and in some degree, you could say the tag team title. Yeah, in some degree, the TV title as well. But the the women's title was not didn't got some exposure, you know, like um, because most of the wrestlers they had like Akira Hokuto, they're not really officially signed with WCW because WCW was in the working agreements with a Japanese company called Gaia. I think it's called Gia Gaia. I think it's Gia, Gaia, I cannot, cannot pronounce it properly, I call it Gaia, uh, Gia. So, yeah, basically, um, yeah, uh, Hokuto was, like, basically played her, played her alliance with that company. She's not really officially signed with the company. She never, this is the last time she wrestled in America, you know, in WCW. She, yeah, she basically, the, she faked the title to go back to her homeland of Japan. She's returned to Japan, didn't take the WCW women's title with her. And the final champion in the history of the WCW Women's Championship, the last women's champion in WCW, was Devil Masami, but was it wasn't a, a show in Japan. She won. She I think it was for the vacant title, and also it was some kind of unification belt. So I don't know much about it. So yeah, Devil Masami was the last champion, and then suddenly, the following year in 1998, the the, the division died. The title was deactivated. So. They promised Medusa, they brought back Medusa to have to do the women's division. Unfortunately, you got Medusa's the only signed wrestler, signed women's wrestler in this division. Uh, other Japanese wrestlers were not really officially part of WCW, but part of Gaia. Um, Deborah was just a manager. Luna Fashan wasn't there in WCW that shortly. And Jacqueline, who's a wrestler, but she was a manager. So, yeah, there was no women's division, so... The only title that Medusa won in her run in WCW was the Cruiserweight title two years, I think it was two two or three years later. I don't want to get into it, so. And Medusa, as this whole retirement shit, she didn't really retire. She took a break from pro wrestling for two years. She came back to WCW in 99 for part of Randy Savage, the whole teen madness bit. And then, and then you know, and then with uh, Aiden Courageous, then... This feud with fucking Oklahoma, Ed Ferrara. I don't want to get. I don't want to get into it. So yeah, yeah. It's just sad how the women's division died on this show. So um, it didn't really got a lot of exposure. You know, Hokuto left the company, go back to the homeland of Japan, and the division died. Anyway, let's move on to the next match. I'm kind of rambling. So uh, the next match. This is a death match. Uh, we got Chris Benoit represent the Horseman. Taking on Meng, who's also represent not also but represent the um the Dungeon of Doom. So this is during the feud between Chris Benoit and Kevin Sullivan, not just in on screen but in real life. Um, because the whole situation with Nancy Sullivan, the future Nancy Benoit. I don't want to get into it for this review. So basically, the goal for Benoit to get another shot at uh. Kevin Sullivan, she need he needs to beat uh, Barbarian. That was the build up to this. Defeat Barbarian at Slambury. This is basically a rematch from Slambury the previous month. At Slambury, Ming won the first death match. This is the second death match. This death match. This is a yeah. This is a last man standing match. Match sucked. Actually, it's not sucked, but it was an okay match. But it was boring. It was just chops and kicks and high flying spots. It was just boring and suplex. It was boring. Fifteen minutes long. You know there is no like last man stand. The whole meaning of a last man standing is last man standing matches are supposed to be hardcore matches. We never got the hardcore 
part in this match. No hardcore in this match. It really brought this match down. You know, people you thought it's gonna be a good match, but it wasn't. It was an okay match. Um, the whole bulk of the match you had Benoit trying to lock in the the cripple crossface onto Meng. Uh, but I think some parts of the match, I think one time Meng locked in the tongue of death grip onto Benoit. Meng is terrible. I don't like Meng. I think he's not that good. I don't think I think he's shit, man. He's just done the tongue of death grip. The kicks, the chops, that's it. I don't get into it. You know, some ja some Islander wrestlers like like Roman and Rock and to me that's okay. Um, they're better. They are better, but Meng is not. I'm sorry. In the end, Benoit managed to lock in the crossface onto Meng. Instead of Meng tapping out, why you have to tap in out? Because this is a death match, a last man standing match. Meng passed out. Benoit won this match. And he went on to face uh, Kevin Sullivan at Bash of the Beach the following month, and that was the and that was a career I think it was a career a career match, and that you know led up to Kevin Sullivan retire from pro wrestling, you know, and then and that was the officially end of the Dungeon of Doom. So, but it's just like yeah, it was just boring. I wish they cut minutes off this match and put a lot of hardcore into this match. You know, like people getting hit by chairs and. Objects fighting in the brawl make it into a really good hardcore brawl, and the and and and, and Benoit won it clean. Just won the match clean. Um, yeah, won it clean because so far the ma some matches end in like interference. I think Benoit won this match clean, just clean. Just the only match won clean. You know, no interference by the Horsemen and no interference by the Dungeon of Doom. So, um. Uh, moving on to the next match, um, we got Steve Mongol McMichael with Deborah. Deborah is the future wife of Stone Cold Steve Austin, taking on Kevin Green. So basically, it's the battle of former American football players because uh, uh, because Kevin uh, Kevin Green was a former player of was it the Carolina Panthers. Ended up going back briefly. That was in like ninety nine before she he retired for football completely. And Mongo used to uh, play for play for the um, was it the um the Chicago Cubs. They had a tag team match at the previous bash uh, not bash uh, the previous Great American Bash in 1996. It was a tag team match. Flair and Arn Anderson taking on uh, Mongo and Kevin Green. Mongo turned on Kevin Green to be part of the Four Horsemen, and this is you know a long one year uh, uh, feud. <laughs> oh. I don't really call it a build, but a feud, because the build to this, the feud is all about Mongo turning on Kevin Green to join the Four Horsemen, so. This is uh, Kevin Green's th uh, third professional wrestling match, I think it was the, his first um, singles match, Mongo, this is his like, set, set 20th, and uh, this was okay, um, just okay, it wasn't bad, but both Mongo and Kevin Green, they're not good workers, man. Um, they're just not. Um, but it was a shorter match. It was 10 minutes, but it was okay. It wasn't bad. It wasn't anything important. One more of the match, you had Deborah, like, basically pulling her rib towards Kevin Green, basically faking like she injured her ankle, but instead it was a, it was a rouge. It was, um, that was a bit awkward because Mongo was in the ring. It was Mongo attacking from behind. It probably makes sense. And in the end, um, Jeff Jarrett, who's also part of the Four Horsemen, Accidentally hits uh, Mongo in the head with a briefcase. Kevin Green pins Mongo for the win. So, like I said, it was an okay match. wasn't terrible. wasn't going to be like a four-star classic. This is just setting up the feud between Mongo and Jarrett. You know, you know. Unfortunately, it never got like a blow-off to the feud because Jarrett ended up leaving WCW at the end of '97. Did the, went to the WWF. Cut like this pro this promo with Steve Austin about yeah you know, basically he used like um because Austin did that three sixteen uh promo you know Austin three sixteen I just whoop your ass promo and then that's um that's basically he's like m really marking the Bible I don't want to get into it so so match num that was match number seven uh yeah match number eight um this is for the WCW. World Tag Team Championships. Uh, we we got the Outsiders. That's Scott Hall and Kevin Nash defending the belts against Ric Flair and Rowdy Roddy Piper. Six. That's Sean Waltman, the future X Pac, when he got returned to the WWF 
1998 in the corner of uh, of the NWO Outsiders. So, um, so basically, Flair and Piper feuding with the NWO in 1996 in the late later parts of 1996. You know, the NWO injured Ric Flair, you know, shoulder, and that was he injured his shoulder in real life. Piper feud with the NWO and also with uh, Holt Hogan when he debuted with the company at Halloween Havoc in 1996, you know, being feuded throughout the end of 1996 to soap in, throughout the whole, you can say, whole of 1997. Uh, this was okay. It was okay. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't great. This is just, yeah, this is setting up a future match at Bash of the Beach. So, okay match. Um, in the end, Flair going after six pack or six. Flair going after Sean Waltman. Piper pulling a fight. You know, there was a, you know, yeah, the, the some books in the match. You had uh, the outsiders, Hall and Nash. It's very sad that both Piper and Hall are no longer with us because Hall died recently, you know, in our current timeline in early 2022. I think he died in March, I think. But I can't really, it's been, I think it's March. March or April time. Uh, anyway, so, yeah, I think it was April. Anyway, so you had, uh, yeah, the, the outsiders working on Flair. Nash did, you know, mocking Ric Flair's strut in. That was funny. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, there was a hot tag with Piper. Piper did the, like, the, the finger pokes, you know, poking Hall in Nash's eye. Then Flair chasing after Six out of the ring. Where's Flair? Didn't came back to save Roddy Piper. Piper pulled up his dukes against Hall and Nash on his own. Unfortunately, the numbers game catching up with, um, Roddy Piper. In the end, Scott Hall hit the outside his edge onto Roddy Piper to win this match and retain the, um, WCW World Tag Team Championships. Like I said, they went on to face the Steiners at Rod Wild in August. And they went on to drop the tag team belts to the Steiners in October. And they regained the titles back in at uh, Super Brawl 8 in February of the following year. Go and check out my review of WCW Super Brawl 8. So moving on to the main event. This is self proclaimed a Lights Out match. It's not similar to the light out, Lights Out matches in AEW. We got Macho Man Randy Savage with Miss Elizabeth in his corner, taking on Diamond Dallas Page with Kimberly, his real life wife at the time, in his corner. So it started in January '97, or January, yeah, January '97, when basically the NWO is DDP's n number one target. When basically DDP refused to join the NWO, refused to wear the T-shirt. Hit Scott's, um, I'm going to say Scott Steiner, but hit Scott Hall with the Diamond Cutter. His big feud was against Randy Savage. That really puts DDP's career truly on the map as the like this big star. At Spring Stampede, um, DDP won the first match. Within the build-up to this, you had Randy Savage. Basically at Slambury, you know, you had um, DDP call Macho Man Randy Savage. You're just Hollywood, Hollywood Hogan's bitch. The, yeah, the, I think on a Nitro, um, basically you had Savage attacking um, the commissioner of WCW at the time. There was a lot of 40 figures. you got J.J. Dillon, you got Eric Bischoff, who was the president of WCW at the time. And then later on in the year, they added um, Roddy Piper. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So Savage attacked J.J. Dillon. And then instead of Dillon, J.J. kayfaving, um, suspending Savage... He decides to put Savage in a match against um, DDP. This is a lights out match. Anything is a, basically a false count anywhere match. Anything goes. No DQs. No count outs. Anything goes. So uh, the match is good. I really like this match. You know, match of the night. They're fighting the the fighting outside of the you know not fighting outside. They're fighting in the crowds. Um, Savage attack a referee. Attack a uh, yeah. Attack a cameraman. You know. Photographer breaking his camera in the process. I think there was uh, some like spot like someone's gonna go through Doing like a move onto the hard concrete floor. I don't I'm not too sure can't remember I lost count on it, but um in the end um, yeah uh, Yeah, um, you know Scott Hall got involved um, You know DDP hit the diamond cutter onto Randy Savage you thought DDP is gonna win again and then Scott Hall attacked um, Randy Savage, uh, not Randy Savage, uh, Diamond Dallas Page. Hit uh, DDP in the head with the tag team towel belt. Hit uh, DDP with the outsider's edge. Savage hit the elbow, or was it the diving elbow off the top rope to win this match. 
and DDP, uh, basically the map, uh, basically uh, Savage equalized this feud because, like, because DDP won the first match at Spring Stampede, and now Savage won the second match at the Great American Bash. They had the blow off at Halloween Havoc '97 that uh, Randy Savage uh, won this feud. In my opinion, I didn't really got a chance to say it. It's been a long time since I reviewed Halloween Havoc '97. That was last year, by the way. But um, I'm gonna say it anyway. If I did say, I'm going to say it right now. I think it's a mistake having Savage win this feud. I'd rather have DDP winning this feud. Because you're building DDP up as the next top star. You know, he went on to become a top star in the rest of the, for the rest of the, of the company's existence. When the company went under in 2001. So, because I, because, I mean, yeah, this feud really put DDP truly on the map. He was in WCW for a very long time. He was kind of like a manager slash... Mid card guy, he was not kind of getting anywhere, but um, he was kind of like just a mid card guy. But um, you know, like, yeah, he won that uh battle ball battle royal at Slambury in '96, but that's not truly really got him nowhere. But this feud with the NWO and Randy Savage truly got him on the map. He went on to become a three time WCW world champion in the, in the rest of his run in WCW, like I said, before the company went under in 2001. So but um, yeah, I think Savage was the wrong guy um, over. I think DDP, DDP should have really won this feud, in my opinion. My, uh, so anyway, the whole stuff with Scott Hall interfering, it, that just set up a tag team match at Bash of the Beach. It was, I think it was, the, it was Savage and Scott Hall taking on DDP and Kurt Henning, who debuted with the company the following month. That led up to DD, uh, Kurt Henning uh, turning on DDP. And then he went on to join the NWO after, like, he was part of the Horsemen's, uh, part of the Horsemen in that War Games match at Fall Brawl in September of 97, so. Anyway, so my final rating of WCW, The Great American Bash, 1997, I give it a, uh, yeah, I give it a, you know what, I give it, a, no, you know what, I give it an 8 out of 10, uh, no, 7 out of 10? You know what, fuck it, let's give it an 8 and a half out of 10, man, this was a good show, the Cruiserweight, Started strong, and DDP and Randy Savage ended strong. So, um, the the two matches in the bad for me has to be Conan versus Hugh Morris and Glazier versus Wrath. The matches in the okay was the okay, like uh, Benoit Meng in the death match, um, Mongo and Green was okay. It was just set up, um, uh, was it the uh, just set up further up the rivalry between Jeff Jarrett and Mongo. That was it. Um, and by the way, the tag team title match between the Outsiders versus Flair and Piper is just setting up Piper and Flair at Bash of the Beach the following month. But the good is the good. I really enjoy, um, enjoy the opener. You know, that's Ultimo Dragon versus um, Psychosis. I join the tag team, tag team match between the Steiners and Hall Heat instead of the, the DQ finish. I, I, I think the women's title, the WCW women's title match between Hokotofus and Medusa, you know, that was good. That was you know, Medusa's final match for two years. And the final match of the, the final, like, the final time that the WCW women's title was defended on a pay-per-view. And also, I like, I like the main event between DDP and Randy Savage, so. Yeah, 1997's WCW was an all-time high. You know, it's better than watching, yeah, it's way better than watching and, like, reviewing uh, Mayhem 99. And Slamboree 99, so. Anyway, so hope you enjoyed my review of WCW Great American Bash 1997. Leave your thoughts in the comments section below. Smash like button, click the, click the like, click the bell. Subscribe to the channel. Be part of the Central Unit for more wrestling videos and more. Next time, getting away from 97. I'm reviewing, uh, it's been a long time since I reviewed a 1991 show. The last 1991 WCW show I reviewed was Halloween Havoc 91. So... We're in 91, so this is the first pay-per-view after Ric Flair left the company, took the WCW World Tie with him to the World Wrestling Federation, so this show needed a new world champion, you know, so, and the fans chanting, we want Flair all night long, you know what I'm talking about, what's the next show I'm going to review, the next WCW show I'm going to review, that's right, I'm going to review WCW, The Great American Bash, 1991. So this is the Central Man officially signing out. Check you later, folks. And that's my review of WCW, The Great American Bash, 1997.
yeah, I'll give it a thumbs up.